Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. Want to improve your organization's customer service? Looking for insider tips to knock your customer socks off? Then you're in the right place. Here's your host, Yannick Grant. Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. On today's episode, our guest is Rich Edwards. Rich is the CEO of Mindspan Systems, helping community financial institutions transform themselves with data-driven strategies and technologies. Community banks and credit unions have incredibly strong connections with their local customers when they're in the branch. Rich's expertise is crafting customer experiences to strengthen these relationships outside the branch's walls. After serving as a captain in the U.S. Army, Rich went on to IBM, spending over 20 years working with financial institutions on Wall Street and across the world. As the product management lead overseeing the launch of the IBM Watson Developer Cloud, he helped financial service firms leverage market-leading analytics, AI, and machine learning approaches, which is so relevant in this time that we're operating in. So without further delay, sit back, plug your earphones in, and let's jump right into this conversation with Rich. Welcome, Rich. All right. Thank you for having me, Unique. It's glad to be here. Awesome. Now, we always like to give our guests an opportunity to share a little bit about their journey. You know, I know we read your bio and it kind of gives us a summary mm-hmm. of who you are, but in your own words, could you tell us how did you get to where you are today? Oh, sure. And it's a, a rather unlikely path. Uh, like you said, I started off my my career in, in military and this was in the 90s. So it was a completely different experience than it, than it is today. And I uh, did a little short stint uh, working in manufacturing in, in communications in the fiber optic cable industry um, and then ended up at, at IBM. And, and I was working in the software business in IBM and, and spent about 10, 11 years um, on the enterprise side and worked an awful lot with um, large banks, financial institutions, uh, the, the population side, like Social Security Administration, um, several um, um, national banks, federal banks, uh, exchanges, things like that, that had like very, very high uh, hundreds of millions of, of entities to, to keep track of. Um, and around the end of 2013, um, I got uh, approached to join a new business unit in IBM that eventually became IBM Watson. It was the artificial intelligence business unit. And up until that point, um, it had largely been around some long going, uh, ongoing knowledge management um, solutions that were tied to um, healthcare. And this is kind of what you saw in a lot of the public facing material in the commercials and, and interviews like that, you know, um, was around some of the work that, that was being done in uh, cancer research. And um, they were looking to build a new solution where our partners could build on top of the technology. So instead of buying a ready-made solution from IBM, which was very much in the model of the traditional um, professional services um, uh, solution or or product, we wanted to give them a platform that they could build on top of. And this this was a somewhat novel idea uh, in 2013. Uh, There were some things that that Google was doing, particularly along the lines of, of, um, of voice recognition that was kind of tied to their, their mobile play uh, with the, uh, the Android ecosystem. Uh, but nobody was really doing, say, natural language processing as a service. Um, it, it, it's certainly not as a, as a commercial offering at that point. And so that's kind of what we built out. That's, that's what we did. And, and uh, you know, it was very much to the cutting edge of, of what was being done at the time. Um, and it was a really, really interesting time to be involved in that. Uh, and, you know, once we kind of got through the initial offering part, which was really what my job there was, was to figure out how to make all the cogs work inside an organization like, um, IBM to bring a new product to market. Um, it became about the customers and, and the customer facing side of it. And particularly beginning to explore all of the use cases that were out there and how we could apply what was becoming a much more accessible technology um, to um, a lot of places that really didn't have access to it before, right? It certainly didn't have access to a lot of the technology that was sitting inside IBM and IBM research. 
Um, and me having had this background in, in financial services and, and banking, I kind of became like the banking guy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and made all the, the trips to a lot of the large financial institutions and, and government entities, um, you know, on, on the public facing side. Um, and so that was that was really, really exciting to kind of be part of that. Um, and I ended up doing that for almost four years, uh, built out a couple of different teams. We had a, a developer uh, evangelism team, which was, which was basically helping our customers build on top of the technology. Um, and, and that was a, a, a somewhat novel approach uh, for at least this part of the business for IBM. And so it was a lot of like doing brand new things. And that was really interesting and really exciting. And um, in 2018, um, I, you know, I really thought there was a lot of potential around this and, and didn't really see um, how I was going to be able to exploit that or, or, you know, take it any further within IBM in the direction they wanted to go. And so I ended up leaving um, and uh, bought Mindspan Systems. And uh, the reason I bought Mindspan Systems was they um, had a very long background in um, hard data skills, um, data analytics, uh, data manipulation, data warehousing, all of the things around how do you take control of an organization's or help an organization take control of, of their data and get the most out of it. Um, and I really saw that this is where the future was going to be for a lot of organizations to be able to get ahead, meaning the technology around artificial intelligence, the technology around things like natural language processing and kind of what you see today uh, with large language models like ChatGPT, et cetera, um, that layer of it is quickly becoming commoditized. It's not to say that it's not exciting that there's not a lot there, but that's not where all the value is going to be. The value isn't going to be in um, the way in which you're able to configure and the UI of, of the data and everything. It's going to be in the data itself. So the individual companies that are able to control and harness and leverage their data in a way, utilizing technologies like large language metals and, and other things that are available out there, um, that's where the value is going to be. And so it's having those data skills and the data capabilities in-house to leverage your own data, your first party data. That's where I believe, and we're beginning to see an awful lot of uh, evidence of this, that's where a lot of the value is going to be for companies in how they reach out to their customers. All right. So that was really, really good. Great insight on your journey and how you got to where you are today. I was really intrigued by um, you focusing on the fact that the data is what will drive how you have the conversations with your customers. And since you're an expert in the finance sector, could you give us maybe two to three, I would say, maybe points or, or influences that um, organizations would be looking into in terms of ensuring that they are listening to their customers, they are adding value to their customers' experiences? Like what are customers in that space looking for now? Sure. No, 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 no. And, and, and I'll say, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples and talk about it from, from you know, banking and financial services, but but these trends are much broader than that. This isn't like an industry specific or on, only limited to to those types of, of, uh, of companies. Okay. Um, th there is a huge consumer preference for personalization, meaning um, people want to be treated like individuals. Mm -hmm. they, they want to be um, understood and valued by the companies and the brands that they do business with. When they begin to feel that, you know, it's almost like a herding cattle situation and that they're unable to get the service level that they believe they deserved or what they thought they were signing up for, that huge way to uh, ruin customer satisfaction and ruin the value of a brand. Um, there, there certainly are, are aspects of where very highly leveraged, highly automated, you know, industrialized processes work. Um, you look at like Amazon, for example, right? The, 
famously, there is no phone number for Amazon, right? Mm-hmm. If you have a problem, you are never going to get somebody on the phone to help you resolve that. And by and large, it seems like, it, at least in the U.S., people have agreed that that's, that's the deal that they're getting of, of customer service for the, the convenience and the price advantage of what they get. Um, now, in, in return, they get very, they sell this as a service, um, uh, product recommendation, next best offer. Like they're very good at that. They, they, they are able to um, leverage the information they have about individual consumers to continue to be relevant to them, to continue to be um, someone that they go, their go-to. So that's one, one example of that. Now, I, I will say in the, in the financial services um, space, particularly community banking, their business model looks a lot more like a retail organization than it does, say, a Wall Street bank. Um, and, and the reason for that is the, the long legacy is the, the local branch, um, the local experience of, of going in and working with a teller or working with a local banker for you know, your financial transaction, whether you're getting a mortgage, or, you know, dealing with your, your day-to-day checking or, or bill pay situation or a car loan. You know, you have this place that you can go to and and go in and and meet them. And the experience of that for um, community banks, I mean, you know, a lot of these institutions are over 100 years old and they have very carefully honed that experience. You know, when you go into a a bank or credit union like that, you're dealing with someone who um, works for a local organization. They are all the way up through management, your neighbors. They understand, you know, where you live, what's going on in your community, what um, it's like to be in that experience, to, to deal with the situations that you're in or the opportunities that you have. That's why you see things like um, community financial institutions are way over indexed on business lines in commercial real estate, which is very much a local business mm-hmm. and um, participation in small business, um, small business administration loans, um, because they're tied into that local uh, local community. They know things, they are much closer to their customers than large regional or national banks are. And mm-hmm. they leverage that and that's their experience. Right. Where, where that seems to fall down for them is when you leave the branch, when you're not there in front of the teller or not, you know, at the drive through and not at one of their ATMs, but you're dealing um, through the web or through a partner or through their app, that level of personalized services be- begins to fall off. It begins to be not as sharp and crisp as it is in branch. And, and that's where I believe there's a major opportunity for companies uh, like this to improve um, both the customer experience, but also their differentiation, their ability to stay relevant compared to much larger, much more well-financed institutions. Okay. So it's interesting you said that it falls off. The service is not the same. Do you think it's because it lacks the human component? So that personal touch that you get when you're in branch talking to a live human being is a completely different interaction if you're dealing with you know an application or you're dealing with a website you know it's it's just right it's... no absolutely yeah I, and part part of this is you know up until even through the great recession I, I i'm there's a stat i'm trying to remember and i don't have it off the top of my head but but even through about 2014 2015 um a good chunk of um community fi's business was was in person it was uh, it was foot traffic in the branch. It was certainly dropping off, um, but then you saw this big influx of investment dollars that went into financial technology or fintech industry, and that started around 2018, mm-hmm. and then slowly began to kind of erode their their relevance, their position in the market. The the, the two big ones there that, that come to mind are um, in the peer to peer payment segment. So uh, Venmo. And then later, Cash App um, had this incredibly explosive growth where they just kind of stepped right in front of what would normally be a a cash or a transaction that might involve your bank into this completely separate thing that was, you know, mobile first, mobile only. 
um, and began to see more and more relevance for companies like this to stand in place of at least a slice of what the services, you know, a traditional bank would provide. Mm -hmm. um, and then COVID and then, you know, everything fell over and it just accelerated everything there by five to seven years. Right. Um, so they're in that position now where this, in this incredible experience that they're able to provide in person, um, you know, they've lost that that advantage, at, at least from a percentage of time, percentage of customers that they're able to get in front of. And the core providers for community banks, you know, that do their core banking, kind of think like, ERP for banking, um, for, for banks this size, you, you know, there's only a handful of providers. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think the top three have about an 80, 85% market penetration, mm -hmm. right? So it's it, it, not quite a monopoly, but it's a oligopoly. Um, and, and they are notorious for being very slow to offer new offerings to them. Uh, so this need to say, well, we, we need to be able to translate this great in-person uh, experience that we have into our digital channels, um, they're hampered by that. They're, they're not provided the tools there. Now, there's plenty of tools out in the market for it, but most of them are geared towards more a uh, online retailer or um, you know, a, a brick and mortars retail that has an online channel. It's, it's more geared towards a retail transaction, which is very different from banking. Yeah. Um, different enough that you know, you, you're either going to find a, a lot of these um, institutions either just going without and skipping it or trying to contort themselves into a, a set of offerings and tools that really wasn't built for them and is suboptimal. And they spend a lot of time, you know, trying to make it work. And it really isn't. So from a customer engagement standpoint, there really is a hole in the market for um, financial services. Uh particularly when it comes to that engagement level, the customer, the customer facing layer. Right. Okay, Rich. Now, if you could share with our listeners, maybe one piece of advice that you'd give them, you know, we're basically halfway through the year, June the 5th today. Um, mm -hmm. But let's say you were to give them one piece of advice where data is concerned in their businesses. What would that piece of advice be to kind of propel them in the direction of what you believe is the best way to go? You know, te technology is is great. Um, it it has benefited society immensely. Um, but but there's always a mistake to kind of engage with or or buy or you know try out technology for technology's sake. And you know, as, as a marketer or as an entrepreneur or somebody who's running a company, you, you always kind of have to have take a first principles approach to it, right? And think about. From a customer standpoint, what what problem am I solving here, right? And how is, you know, technology going to help me do that better, or or do it in a more efficient manner? Um, so you always want to kind of put it through that lens of, you know, you need to be a little bit of a of a pragmatist when it comes to this. Um, you look at, you know, as as you said, we're we're sitting here, you know, now at the end of second quarter of 2023. Uh, massive proliferation of, um, you know, the use of chat GPT and things like it um, in, in a lot of different use cases. And a lot of them, when you, when you kind of dig beneath, beneath the layer of it, they, they kind of look like, you know, a hammer looking for a nail um, that uh, it, it's really neat. It does some cool things, but, it, but it's not really um, in service of, probably a, a persistent or an important problem, either for, for the company or for the customer. Um, and so really being to layer that on there and use that as a lens for how do you evaluate this? Um, how do I evaluate what I'm doing? Uh, that, you know, that's an important consideration. Um, on the data side, I will say, um, just in general, and it's, especially true for regulated industries like like financial services and, and like um, healthcare in, in particular. But uh, the data that you have about your customers, about your market, about you know how your industry works, particularly the data that is not held by anybody else, understand that that's becoming increasingly a valuable asset. 
Um, that's going to be something that even if you don't have a clear use case today or a clear path for how you can leverage that today, understand that that's only going to get more and more valuable. First party data, the data that, that you have about your, your business and your customers only gets more valuable as, you know, things like the commoditization of artificial intelligence and, you know, other aspects of it get broader and broader. Um, you know, to think of it this way, um, you know, the, the, the market for writing a boring press release, uh, effectively the price for that has gone to zero, right? D doing anything that is generic or bland or something that you can leverage, you know, in an open source database about, or even the things that are available like, like chat GPT, right? If chat GPT can answer the question or, or develop it for you, it is now a commodity. Everybody has that. It doesn't make you special. It, it will not help differentiate what you're doing uh, or how you present to your customers. You may have to do it because everyone else is, and it, it, it becomes a cost of doing business, but it's not going to be a differentiator. But your data that you have, when you can take something like that and layer on what you know, right? Uh, think of a really simple situation like I can go to ChatGB and I, I can say, look, write me a, a Facebook um, a headline for a display ad for, um, you know, women's purses that are, you know, vegan leather in red with, uh, you know, gold gold accents on it, right? It, it can give you like 10 or 12 versions, right? But your ability, say, as an ad agency to say like, yes, these 12 are options, but these four at the top are going to double your chance of conversions and reduce your cost of acquisitions by half. That's where all the value is. Mm. Your ability of knowing how you're going to leverage this and the impact that that's going to have on your customers, that's where you're going to be able to get that advantage. And so that whole idea of really understanding what you know and the level of which it's codified in your data, you know, that, that you can look at it and hold on to it, that's really going to be a point of differentiation and competitive advantage going forward. All right. Awesome. That was an excellent example. Thank you so much for sharing, Rich. Now, Rich, could you share with us what's the one online resource, tool, website or app that you absolutely can't live without in your business? I'll say um, really, really to do tracking. Um, and, and there's a lot of options there. Uh, I use um, I'm, I'm, I use a Mac for work and uh, I use a program called Things, which does that. Um, but for a long time, I was on paper, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's not so much like having these, these, these long list of to-dos and it's about personal productivity and for It's more the idea, and, and this comes from, um, uh, the, the, there's a book called Getting Things Done by David Allen, mm -hmm. um, which is very much like the Bible on personal productivity, right? You know, right. it goes into a lot of things. But but the value isn't so much the forcing yourself to do things. It's when something comes up, you have a bulletproof way in which you capture it and you don't have to think about it anymore. And it, it's that ability of, you know, not having all these things floating around in your head, distracting you from what's really important and what you need to focus on. That's the really value, the, the value in it. So that ability to not have to worry about, you know, particularly as an entrepreneur, the 20, 30, 40, 50 things that you're eventually going to have to deal with, but put all of your focus and your energy on that one really important thing that you're working on right now um, and know that you're working on the most important thing. That's, I, I don't know that I could run my business without the ability to do that. All right. So we'll have the link to that application in the show notes of this episode. Thank you for sharing. Sure. That dovetails us into my next question. What's the one thing that's going on in your life right now that you're really excited about? Either something you're working on to develop yourself or your people. Oh, sure. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think really this this tipping point in in artificial intelligence just based on my background because you know i've now been involved in it you know very much on the on the bleeding edge of it for 10 years to, to kind of really see it begin to tip over into the mainstream is is pretty exciting and one it's obviously that you know to see the thing begin to pay off the way that 
you know, it's been promising for, for, for quite some time, but, but also the way in which it's a, a lot more acceptable from a mainstream standpoint, right? The, the idea of, of incorporating machine learning or, or artificial intelligence in, into a business process is, is not as crazy idea as it was, you know, even two or three years ago. Um, and everybody's looking to kind of do it now, um, e even if only from a competitive parity standpoint. Um, and I think the the biggest thing there, and, and this is kind of my angle and, you know, with my company, what, you know, our reason for being it, is really around giving parity to smaller businesses, particularly more agile businesses that are that are willing to step out and, and take a risk on something like this. It is the ability to um, really enhance small businesses, sometimes startups, sometimes established small businesses. And, you know, like I said, where we focus with community financial institutions, it's it's the ability to kind of give them um, that that competitiveness with what were for a long time just the Goliaths of their industry. Um, and I, I think particularly now in, in 2023, as, as we're looking at, you know, at a, at a potential economic slowdown, you know, it's it's really the the small business um small business sector and, and in particular the job creation that comes out of it is the big leading indicator and certainly the determiner of how quickly um an economy comes out of out of even a slowdown, let alone a full blown recession. Um, so the more that that's there to kind of help that along, to speed it, to um, reduce a lot of the friction from innovation at that level, at the small business level, uh, the better off we're going to be and, and the quicker we're going to be able to return to, you know, a real, a real growth setting, uh, a, you know, growth posture as a company. Great. Awesome. All right. So in wrapping our interviews up, Bridge, we always like to find out from our guests, where can our listeners find you online? You, you, if you're interested in, in kind of what we do and how we can help you, you can you can look at our website, mindspaninc.com. Uh, and if you're you're interested in connecting with me or reading some of the things that I write about, um, I'm I'm active on LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, both under Rich Edwards. Uh, so LinkedIn slash in slash Rich Edwards or at Rich Edwards on Twitter. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Rich, for taking time out of your very busy day today for joining us on this podcast. We really appreciate all the great insights that you've shared with us as it relates to AI and, you know, using data to drive our decisions and really giving customers what they value versus what we think they need. It was very, a uh, very great conversation. And I know our listeners would have gained great insight and value out of this conversation. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Just want to remind our listeners that you can follow us on Twitter at Navigating CX and feel free to hop on Facebook and join our private Facebook group, Navigating the Customer Experience Community. Until next time, I'm your host, Yannick Grant. The ABCs of a Fantastic Customer Experience webinar will be hosted on Wednesday, July 26, 2023 at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This webinar will be provided with a complimentary copy of the ABCs of a Fantastic Customer Experience book. Who should attend? Customer service representatives, customer care officers, customer service associates, support agents, business development officers, customer care representatives, cashiers, receptionists, sales and service representatives, customer retention agents, client support specialists, customer engagement officers, client care coordinators, reservation specialists, reservations agents, collections officers, client relationship officers, administrators, account executives, if you deal with customers daily and you are seeking reinforcement of the skills needed to offer an exceptional experience, then this webinar is for you. This webinar will cover managing customer expectations. What are the four things customer expectations are based on? Customer service skills. What are the skills and competences required to serve others? Handling irate and difficult customers. How to handle difficult and irate customers in a busy work environment. Your attitude, communication, finding solutions, and rapid response. Tools that you will need to help you exceed your customers' expectations. 
This webinar will help you ignite your customer service skills, navigate your emotions, and better understand how to serve customers during a time when the customer is even more demanding than before. Your business will see the exponential rewards when your team members are continually creating fantastic and memorable experiences for your customers. Please visit the register here on our podcast show notes page and please feel free to hop on over to Instagram. You can visit our business page, Customer Service Global, that's C-U-S-T-O-M-E-R-G-L-O-B-A. Or you can visit Yannick W.A. Grant, that's Y-A-N-I-Q-U-E-W-A-G-R-A-N-T. Both Instagram handles will have the link for you to register for this amazing webinar. We look forward to seeing you there. Please come and bring all your friends and colleagues. Thanks for listening. For more awesome resources to take your customer service game to another level, head over to navigatingthecustomerexperience.com. See you next time.